Hi, everybody. I'm Elaine Klatt. I'm an undergraduate research assistant from Northeastern University, and I'm excited to share my team's work on identifying labor exploitation in the agricultural sector using data analysis with you today. So taking a step back, first we have to talk about what the agricultural sector is. And as you can tell from the slide, it's a $1 trillion industry that represents 5.7% of the US economy, and it's supported by 21.6 million employees. So it's huge. But the agricultural sector is also one of the top three sectors with the most prevalence of labor trafficking in the US. It's one of the top three labor sectors with the most federally prosecuted labor trafficking cases in the US. And it's an emerging area of study among social scientists, which provides the necessary context to support operations engineering modeling approaches. So the labor inspectors, whose job it is to identify labor exploitation in the expanse that is the agricultural industry, have described their job as searching for a needle in a haystack. And our goal with this project is to find ways to help them prioritize. So how exactly then can we use data analysis to identify labor exploitation in the agricultural sector? There's a lack of data related to exploitation and human trafficking that many people in our field have talked about. And one way to address this is to create new data through primary data collection or by working with social scientists to extract quantitative data elements from qualitative data, which the criminal justice members of our team are working to do through case file analysis and coding. On the industrial engineering side, we're exploring how data that already exists that doesn't directly focus on human trafficking could be used to better understand where that trafficking or exploitation may be occurring by merging it with other data sets. So both of the data sets we're looking at in this project are available to the public, but no one has taken the time to link them before. And if we can create a linked data set, we can share information on potential exploitation or trafficking with agencies that have not communicated their respective information to one another. Labor exploitation exists on a continuum. As you can see on one end of the continuum here is decent work. And decent work is something workers desire. It's work in conditions of dignity, safety, adequate remuneration. And on the other end is forced labor, which is all work or service that's not voluntary and is exacted under menace of a penalty. And along with forced labor, there's also labor trafficking which more specifically is recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, or obtaining of a person for labor, of, labor or services through the use of force, fraud, or coercion. So it's much more specific, but it's still forced labor. Labor law interventions and criminal law interventions, as you can see, come in at different points on the continuum, but anywhere interventions are used can be considered labor exploitation. So forced labor and labor trafficking are very obviously forms of exploitation, but so are things like instances of workers being criminally underpaid or made to work in less than safe conditions. Again, it's on a spectrum. One population that's particularly vulnerable to exploitation is people on H-2A visas. The H-2A visa program is specifically for migrant agricultural workers and the certification process starts when US companies apply for temporary labor certifications, which the Department of Labor then either denies or grants. When companies have been certified to host the temporary migrant workers, they post job openings, which prospective migrant workers apply for. The prospective migrant workers then apply for H-2A visas. And if those are granted, the approved workers finally enter the US. It's kind of a lengthy process, but the H-2A program has a huge reach and nearly 243,000 workers were brought to the U.S. farms through the program in 2018. But H-2A visa holders are particularly vulnerable to exploitation because they're only permitted to work for that one employer whose job they applied for when they were applying for the visa. And they can't seek other employment while they're here in the U.S. on that visa. So this gives employers the power to essentially deport workers by terminating their employment. Because we know that people on h 2 visas are particularly vulnerable to labor exploitation, we're looking at merging two data sets, H-2A data and labor violation data. So from the US Department of Labor, we have data regarding employers certified to host H-2A workers from the fiscal years 2008 through 2019. And this data set contains important dates, locations, it's got employer names, it's got number of employees re requested and certified, all kinds of stuff that a, uh, an employer would need to know to get these H-2A workers onto their work sites. 
These data are publicly available on the Employment and Training Administration's website. And then our second data set, which is also from the Department of Labor, is data regarding labor law violations from almost six decades. But because we only have data from 20, 2008 through 2019 for our H2A data set, we're only considering the data fiscal year 2008 through 2019 for our labor violations data set as well. And the labor violations data set contains pretty similar information to the H2A data set. It's got employer names, addresses, phone numbers, and then of course, a list of all the violations that um, a company was found to have committed. So from these two data sets, we plan to use fuzzy matching on the employer names to link relevant records and identify where the two data sets intersect. And this can tell us which employers receive H2A employees, which employers have been investigated for labor violations, and which have both, potentially giving us information on labor exploitation. We're also investigating 12 federally prosecuted cases of agricultural labor exploitation and trafficking, one of which focuses on the conglomerate called Global Horizons. So this case is particularly interesting because many of the documented victims in the case were on H2A visas and the data sets we're working with, we're working to link, demonstrate a connection between companies that employed H2A workers and companies that were prosecuted for labor violations. So as you can see in the graphic here, the companies on the left and in the center employed H2A workers and the companies on the right and in the center were prosecuted for labor violations. The intersection in the center with those four companies clearly indicates agricultural labor exploitation and potentially indicates labor trafficking. So let's dive deeper into the data sets, starting with the H2A data set. The H2A data set contains information on case decisions, important dates, employers, job details, locations, number of workers, and relevant sectors. There's a lot of stuff in there. Again, the H2A data set contains information about employers who applied to host workers on H2A visas, not the workers themselves. Information in the data set is provided by employers and system generated metadata, which includes the fields like receive dates or decision dates. But the information entered by employers at times contain typos or blank fields, many of which were corrected using additional information available in the data set. So, for example, one of the major ways in which the data set had to be cleaned was in the North American Industry Classification System codes, or NAICS codes for short. So there are over 120,000 records in this data set, and about 78,000 of them just did not have a code at all, and 9,000 had a clearly incorrect code. So all but 17 of those were assigned the correct NAICS code for analysis. Which leads us into our analyses. I'd like to share two different kinds of analyses today, starting with our H2A data set. I'd like to look at how applications change over time and the relationship between sectors and certified workers. And then looking at both of our data sets, I'd like to look at some preliminary observations of similarities between them. So first we have the ways in which applications change over time. The number of H2A workers each year changes based on politics because the current administration each year sets limits on visas. And as you can see in the chart here in the light purple, most of applications are certified with partial certifications in the darker purple being common until about 2014. We plan to investigate uh, characteristics of denied applications in the future. There might be a link between companies who have been investigated for labor violations and companies who are denied H2A certifications. And in the past five years, withdrawn applications have become more common. So we might investigate the characteristics of those applications in addition to the characteristics of denied applications. Looking more closely at the sectors, this chart shows the average number of H2A workers certified by application and sector. So more workers are certified per application in the crop production sector than any other sector, which gives us information about what kind of work sites H2A workers are at. Crop production might consist of hand-picked or machine-picked crops, which we plan to investigate further because we know a lot of migrant workers are hired for hand-picking jobs. And support activities for agriculture and forestry includes farm labor contractors and crew leaders. So that may include support across multiple sectors. Diving deeper still, we've got some subsectors here. This chart shows the top 10 subsectors by the total number of certified workers over all the available years. 
looking at the subsectors more specifically can give us information on what kind of work sites H2A visa recipients are working at. So this can tell us things like whether H2A workers are doing machine or hand picking, whether they're working in fields or greenhouses, and whether they're working with crops or animals. And if we look at a map of the US, we can map the sectors with the most certified workers to some of the states with the most certified workers, giving us insight into where those work sites are located. So taking some of the subsectors from the last slide, tobacco farming, very common in North Carolina, corn farming, there's some production in North Carolina and California, nursery and floriculture production is common in all five states on the map here, uh, sheep farming, pretty common in California, and there's a lot of sugarcane farming in Florida. So just looking at those five of the top 10 sectors by certified workers, they map pretty neatly to the states with the most certified workers as well. Our second data set is the labor violations data set, and that contains information on violations of the Fair Labor Standards Act, the Migrant and Seasonal Agricultural Worker Protection Act, and the standards of the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, among a number of other things. The data set also lists H-2A violations, which can generally be summarized as the failure to provide required benefits, whether that be adequate compensation for work, housing, or other promise benefits, uh, the displacement of US workers for the employment of migrant workers, impeding a department or labor or other investigation, and discrimination, non-compliance with regulations, or fraud. And all the violations listed in this data set have been found through Department of Labor investigations. So taking a preliminary look at the link between H-2A workers and violations, the states with the most H-2A certified workers on the left and the states with the most H-2A violations on the right appear to map to one another. You can see that Florida stands out on both maps, as do California, Washington, and Kentucky. However, just looking at the states with the most H-2A certified workers or the states with the most H-2A violations has us focusing on different states than if we look at the ratio of violations to certified workers. So looking at this map, now instead of jumping out of Florida, California, Washington, and Kentucky, we're more drawn toward New Mexico, Nebraska, Kansas, Missouri, Illinois, and West Virginia, which you probably wouldn't expect because these states have lower numbers of workers certified, but they have a much higher ratio of H-2A violations per certified worker than the states with simply the largest number of violations. So to understand why we end up looking at different states when we examine this ratio, we plan to investigate the resources that are available in each state. It's possible that states with higher ratios of violations to workers have more resources and human trafficking task forces available, so the violations are getting caught more easily, which makes them show up brighter colors on this map. But the opposite might also be possible. These states could have fewer resources available, so employers are committing more violations than they are in other states. We hope to investigate this further in the following stages of our project. From our preliminary analyses, we've learned a few things. Information from the H2A data set can tell us where migrant agricultural workers are and what type of work they're doing. It can also show us some information about employers and in the future, we hope to link the employer names from the H2A data set with those from the labor violations data set, giving us information on potential labor exploitation. We've also been able to track some of the 12 federally prosecuted cases of agricultural labor exploitation in both the H2A and the labor violations data sets. This leads us to believe that linking the data sets could be helpful in identifying that potential labor exploitation. And finally, our next goal for this project is to link those data sets. We'll keep looking at the 12 federally prosecuted cases that we're coding to see if the organizations show up in those data sets. And we hope to provide useful information to government agencies, particularly the Department of Labor who has identified a need for such information. They released an audit, in a, an internal audit in 2020, saying that they had not established a risk-based process for determining the number of H-2A applications to investigate. So there were no um, data analytics or no account for risk or anything when they said, hey, which applications should we look at to try and identify labor exploitation? So the audit recommended that the Department of Labor use data analytics to establish and document a risk-based audit process. 
and the Department of Labor agreed with this. So we think we can try to provide useful data for this analysis, which in the end will hopefully help to disrupt labor exploitation patterns. And I would like to thank my whole team at Northeastern, the National Science Foundation, and all of you for listening. I'd love to hear your questions.